Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 148 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with returning guest Stanton Gill about growing service berries and Saskatoons in the mid-Atlantic USA. The plant profile is on bearded iris, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with horticulturist and Washington Gardener Magazine's insect index columnist, Carol Allen, who shares the last word on arborist wood chips. This episode, we're joined by returning guest Stanton Gill. He is the Extension Specialist in IPM and Entomology with the University of Maryland Extension and co owner of McBride and Gill Falcon Ridge Fruit Orchard in Westminster, Maryland. Welcome back, Stanton. Oh, good morning. It's great to be back. Great to have you. And in this episode, we're going to talk all about service berries. Mm -hmm. And before we dive into that, let's talk about what's been going on with you since it's been about a year and a quarter or so since you were last on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Any new additions to the farm, any changes at work that we should be aware of? The uh, With Montgomery College, I'm a professor there at night. And we offered a class uh, for the first time, started uh, in December, and it went till the end of January. It was a mini semester. It's online, and that's going to be offered again in 2023, this fall, in December through January. It's very, very popular. Um, They limited to 25 people in the class, and we filled quickly. And it's called Advanced Fruit Production with Integrated Pest Management so uh, if people are interested and want to go further on fruit, there you go. That class is online. It's two nights a week. It's from six o'clock until 930, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we have four Saturday, actually hands-on sessions where we take you up to my orchard and you learn all the techniques of pruning and training and everything else. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. And so because it's it's both in person Mm -hmm. and online yes uh do you have to be a montgomery county resident no sign up no we had people from delaware enrolled this last time i had some people from pennsylvania and virginia um and they actually came in the the, uh things on the weekend or on saturdays and uh they're optional but i tell people that's the chance to get your hands-on experience you know come on out um but if you just want to go for lecture i had one person that moved to florida and they kept taking the class and they were good with it so, um, yeah, it's, that's the beauty of doing things online now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I would think that that in-person is invaluable because that's where you really get to see, you know, the yes. pruning and the techniques. Yes. And then the other thing is uh, Maryland Public TV, which did a, a special about our orchard uh, about a year and a half ago. They played it about three or four times and they said it, it was popular. So they've asked us to do a um, hour session supposedly for this year. So you might see something on Maryland Public TV coming out on the um, McBride and Gill Falcon Ridge farm of all the unusual fruit we grow out there. Cool. I'll have to look out for that. So MPT um, in various stations across the state of Maryland, but also available online, I know. So if you're Mm -hmm. outside Maryland, you can probably find that episode once it goes up. Absolutely. Well, those are great... Um, update Stanton that sounds wonderful and mm-hmm. especially spreading the the gospel on growing your own fruit <laughs> <laughs> we want a lot of people doing that yep, that'd be great mm-hmm. so the fruit we're talking about in today's episode service berry has many different names <laughs> and I'd like to explore some of those first and I mm-hmm. think we should start with that classic Latin name mm-hmm. and uh, maybe take that name apart and then we'll go into all the common names. Okay. Well, it's in the Rose family. Um, the genus is Amelanchor. And then there's several different species, of course. There's uh, Canadensis, which you can find here on the East Coast. And uh, that grows native in um, 
a lot of um, wooded areas on the edges of woods. Um, the one that we grow for fruit cultivation is Amelanchor ulnifolia, which is commonly called Saskatoon. Uh, in places like the Midwest, they tend to call it serviceberry. And in uh, some of the mountain areas, they call it serviceberry. Uh, and that's tied into the bloom time. Supposedly, the, the stories go on it that uh, when the snows would melt uh, from the winter time, and uh, then the parson who would travel through the area would come into these new areas, it was about the same time the blooms would come out. And that was the time people had their marriages. <laughs> so hmm. they, they gave it the name serviceberry. Um, I, I was and, going to interrupt you, Stanton, and say yeah. I heard a different story about okay. serviceberry. Right. And so very similar, parson coming through, snow yeah. melting. Yeah. And that was when you could hold your funeral services oh. because <laughs> the ground had unfrozen <laughs> enough to bur bury the person. And I do like yours as a, a little more <laughs> positive side. So, <laughs> so we, you have the flowers on the trees, you can use the flowers for your service and know that it's cooler. But that's the service I had heard was the funeral service was now that, you know, the ground is loose enough or open enough to do that. And I've also heard another pronunciation of serviceberry as sarvis, S-A-R. <laughs> um, and I just think that is Appalachian accent. I would suspect you're correct on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. And so you were saying beyond serviceberry, I've, there's also shadbush and shadberry. Yes. And then, of course, Saskatoon. Hmm. And the shad bush name, the, the story I had heard is that's when the shad start running, mm -hmm. um, the shad mm -hmm. fish, not, right. go, you know, go up the streams. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know if that coincides with the flowering of the tree <laughs> or the fruiting of the tree. Yeah. I've never got a clear one on that either. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you might talk to an ichthyologist that's involved with the fish to see, um, when exactly they come up on there. But yeah, I, I always assumed it would have something to do with the flowering time, but mm -hmm. um, they run for a fair amount of time. So I think you'd have berries set on there mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere along that line. And yeah. to let people know outside our region, the flowering is usually around, I'm going to say mid-March to early April for us. Yeah, really... It, what controls that is what we call degree days, mm -hmm. and it does vary from year to year. Uh, the last uh, three springs have been very cool and wet, and so things were delayed. This year, uh, you obviously have seen that we didn't have much of a winter. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some cold right after Christmas and right before New Year's. Other than that, it was pretty warm, so a lot of things came very early. Um, some of the Amelanchor uh, canadensis that I have up at the orchard, came into bloom um, in actually early part of March, which is rather early. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the later ones, like the Amelanchor um, ulnifolia, which is a West Coast one, uh, was just in bloom this last week. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, so later. And then yeah. are they susceptible to frost damage like other fruit oh, trees absolutely. are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's in the, in the, as I mentioned earlier, it's in the rose family. So the same thing where apples are and a lot of the other plants. So, um, yeah, there, um, things like last night, um, in certain parts of Maryland, they had uh, frost warnings and it got down around that 33, 34 degrees. So there might've been a little bit of damage. Most of them have berries on them at this point, but probably mm -hmm. minimal damage, but it could be some, but, but earlier, yes, frost could definitely damage blooms. Mm -hmm. mm. And then for the fruiting time, mm -hmm. for me, I'm usually picking my first berries mm -hmm. towards May 25th, always around Memorial Day weekend. How about for you? Um, well, again, the main one we grow is um, Amelanchor uh, ulnifolia, which is, is commonly called the Saskatoon, which is West Coast. Um, those ripen usually with our cherries. And so our early cherries come in. Um, and that's usually the first week in June to about the middle of June. And you can uh, harvest them at different stages, of course. Um, and you know from experience of that, that um, after they are green, they're going to turn kind of a red color. Mm -hmm. And if you pick them then, they, they're um, slightly tart. If you let them hang on there and turn to kind of a bluish color, almost a blueberry color, 
um, then they get really sweet. Then um, they're much better. The only thing is the birds <laughs> yep. pick up on that color. And so a lot of people pick them when they're red and uh, ripen them off the, the plant. They cut a branch or something. You can stick it in the water and let it ripen inside and uh, keep the birds out of there. Yeah. Hmm. I never yeah. heard of cutting a whole branch of them. I've cut, I've done it where when the red is just turning a little blue, just a little mm -hmm. bit of blue blush, mm -hmm. then it's sweet enough to eat. And yeah. then the birds and other creatures haven't figured out quite that it's quite dead ripe yet. Yeah. Um, but cutting off a whole branch, that would be sacrificing a lot from the tree, I would think. Well, um, we do it at our farm market, believe it or not. We, we tried it last year. The berries are... Um, on the canadensis are, are rather small and it, it's very time consuming to pick them. So we cut um, small branches out of it and uh, we put them in glass, um, little glasses that we put out the market and we put a sign out that said, pick your own. And so you came by and you bought a twig with these berries hanging down and people laughed at it at first, but it became very popular. So I think we're going to do that again this year. We, we've done it also with currants and, um, Something else we've done. There's something else we did it with. Yeah, it was the black currants and the and the red currants we've done that with. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do it, and they they do ripen up uh, if you hold them in that water. Um, yeah, so another yeah. way of doing it. So interesting. Yeah. So those who complain that the birds get to them first, you know, <laughs> either pick them red or just when they're just starting to get a blue blush, or cut a few branches for yourself and let the birds have the rest. Yeah. And. I love that pick your own sign because yeah, who doesn't want interactive? So you did talk about a couple things in there. I want to dial back to one is the Saskatoon name mm -hmm. and that or originated because of the Saskatoon region of Canada, I'm guessing. Well, it was the Cree Indians that lived in that area. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they actually, they, their name for it was Miss Saskatoon to Mina. <laughs> rather hard name to say um the colonists that came out obviously couldn't pronounce that correctly so it became saskatoon but the area of saskatoon now is the largest city in that uh, area of saskatchewan um uh providence so um the name kind of stuck and it, it's uh, actually an um european version of a Cree name <laughs> and and it was the Cree name for just a berry mm. <laughs> yeah and then it became the uh, the whole region and then that city yeah. that's that's interesting because yeah. yeah. usually it's the reverse so yeah. it's great and so they must have been available in large numbers in that region for the region oh, to adapt that name they're everywhere out there um years ago i was giving a talk out in uh, the west coast and it was uh, for perennial plant growers and i was talking in insect control when I finished, I came down to the table and started a conversation with one of the people there. And he said he was a school teacher and uh, he was growing perennials, but he also had an orchard. And I asked him what he grew. And he said, Saskatoon. Well, at that point, I'd never heard of Saskatoon. And I said, I don't know what that is. And he said, oh, it's Amelanchor on the folia. And I said, well, we grow Amelanchor out on the East Coast. And he said, not on the folia. Um, the um but anyhow he, he said it is called saskatoon and i said well how are you doing that and he said he's a pick your own operation his trees were about 25 foot high and uh, i said well what type of insurance do you have with people doing pick your own and he said he asked me where i was from and i said the east coast and he said oh out here if someone falls off a ladder they dust themselves off and get back up the ladder and keep picking <laughs> and i said well on the east coast they'd be looking for lawyers hmm. um so I looked into that plant and it is grown all through um, areas, uh, the Western part, you'll find it in Washington state, Oregon, you'll find it in uh, British Columbia. Um, you'll find it in the central part of Canada and a little bit in the Midwest. Um, but no one was really grown here in the East coast. So I brought uh, plants in and started growing them at our orchard uh, back in about 2008 or 2009, somewhere around there. And, um, the, if you let them become a tree, they will get 25 foot high. But um, what you were mentioning about the birds, the birds will wipe you out. And if you're trying to make a commercial business out of this, you want to get all the berries you can. So what we've done with them is we just keep pruning them. And we only let them get six to seven foot high. We treat them like a shrub. 
we make them branch and um, we'll renew prune every couple of years, about every three or four years. We take the big old thick stems out and get new ones growing out, but they flower like crazy. Uh, they're only about six foot high. And then we pull netting over them. Um, not the, the big uh, bird netting that people see that has an inch opening. We have very fine mesh on it. We pull over just when the berries are starting to get that red color and we can bring it right down to the ground. And then when we go to harvest, we just pull the netting back out of there, harvest the thing, and they don't all ripen at the same time. They ripen over, um, oh, maybe two, usually we can almost get three weeks out of them. And because um, the flowers don't all come at the same time or set at the same time. Um, that way you can extend your harvest and we have practically no bird damage on there to speak of. Mm. And such a great point about the harvest being over a few weeks. Yes. I find that too with the candensis that I visit yeah. here and pick from yeah. Yeah. that I can go back usually two to three times. I'll wait three or four days in between. Yes. Um, and you're, you're still picking, picking, picking as you go, which is great, but it is almost all at once in that two to three, kind of like strawberries, you yes. know, you go back and check every few days. And then when the season ends, the season ends. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, great to hear about that fine mesh covering because we don't want our feathered friends stuck in those bird nettings or, right. you know, a snake or another creature getting stuck. So it's always good to check in those. Yeah. And then the birds also learned, uh, if you put it over a plant, they'll bounce on it and they'll peck through that, through those openings. So you need something very fine mesh on there. It's uh, basically what we're using is a mesh that's used for insect screening also. Hmm. Yeah. Good choice and good advice yeah. and i love that idea of a service berry or saskatoon pick your own uh, <laughs> farm i would love to visit one of those and i'm imagining similar to a blueberry pick mm -hmm. your own farm that you're mm -hmm. probably given a pail and you're paying by the weight and you're right it is slow picking <laughs> um so it gets faster once you learn well, yes. you know once you know um you don't want any of the green ones or the dead red maybe but yeah. uh when you're first out picking it's slow um yeah. any advice for that well uh again before we um would cut the stems and actually take them down to the market and put them in a glass of water um we would we actually cut the stems off kathy and bring them into our uh, barn where we have music and we have a table and you can listen to the music and then you can sit there at the table and then we just pull them off the uh, branches very quickly and mm -hmm. then they go right in the container. Uh, the, you know, when we're doing the, some people don't want to go for the stick thing and uh, they want them already pre-picked. We'll do that. And it, it's, it's much easier if you stand there and, and pick it. I mean, it's fun to be outdoors, but if you're trying to make uh, money out of it, um, it, it's not cost effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the um, some of the, the the first ones they actually bred on this thing um, was way back in 1878. They had one they released called Success, and since then they've done some wonderful work out of mainly in Canada, um, some on the west coast, and the most popular one that's grown in Canada is called Smoky, and um, and I and I do grow Smoky. Uh, we have um, another one called Northline, which is very good, and Thysman. Um, but smoky, I see why they do that. It, it's a bigger berry. It's it's much bigger than the um, the native ones that you have here in the East Coast that you were talking about. So that makes it a little bit easier picking, <laughs> picking a bigger berry. Uh, the flavor is excellent on all three of those varieties, smoky, Thysman, and um, the North Line. And since it's rosaceous, um, you do get benefit out of having at least two different cultivars to get a better set on your fruit. If you just grew the one variety, it gets fruit on there, but um, not nearly the good set that you would with these having other varieties out there. Hmm. So yeah. having two different varieties um, uh -huh. and having them, what, within 20 feet of each other? Well, as long as you've got bee activity. Um, uh -huh. You know, if you're, if you're talking about wind pollination, 20 feet would be, yeah, fine. Um, you can have greater distance on that if you have uh, a, a enough pollinator activity in there. Yeah. Yeah. And the bees do love those flowers. They do. Mm. <laughs> it's another benefit of that. And it, not only the, the honeybees, of course, most people think of bees, the honeybees, but a lot of our native bees um, will go to those flowers and they love them. And it's early, it's early in the season. It's providing the nectar they need. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it is one of the earliest fruit trees to bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition, being a native fruit tree, yeah. at least to North America, yeah. um, because you're growing the Western varieties versus some of our East Coast ones. Right. Yep. Hmm. And you talked a little bit about the flavor. So let's talk about that for a bit. So somebody who's never eaten Saskatoon or service berry mm -hmm. before, I always just tell them it's like a mild blueberry, but you're not mm -hmm. going to really get that tartness. Yeah. And that, and that's fine. The, um, the blueberry is the closest thing it would come to um, a little bit. People describe it a little bit as a nutty flavor. And I've never figured out what exactly that meant. I'm not picking oh, up the nut flavor myself, but no, they're talking yeah. about the seed in the middle. Maybe has yeah. a little bit of an almond flavor to it, so you okay. almost get like a little almond in with the blueberry when you eat the seed. Yeah, yeah, but the seed is very much. I mean, it's not a big seed, so you can easily uh, digest that. Um, so the now we have used it in. Um, my wife has made it into things like blueberry pies and blueberry torts, uh, tarts, and, but using Saskatoon in there instead of blueberry. And, um, you know, it, it, most people can't tell the difference between a blueberry pie and a Saskatoon pie once you cook it and put a little bit of sugar in there. Um, very, very mm -hmm. similar. Yeah, I agree. I All the blueberry recipes I have are, are I think, interchangeable for yeah. the service barrier or the mm -hmm. um, Saskatoon, except for cutting the sugar level. Yeah. Um, Cause you usually have to add a lot more sugar for blueberry pie. Yeah. I sometimes don't even use any sugar for yeah. like a blueberry bar that I'm going to put service berry in. Mm -hmm. And the, um, we used to sell them to a restaurant in Alney and they took, it was very interesting what they did. They took the Saskatoons and they were making it into a, uh, a soup. They'd heat that up. And um, I didn't think it would taste very good, but I, I, I was over there. They invited me to come over and try it out. And it was excellent. Very, very good as a soup. Um, and they've done that with our cherries also. And it, mm -hmm. it's uh, quite tasty. Um, the Indians used to um, mix it. Actually, what they're saying is the Indians would take deer meat and dry that down. And then they would mix in the... Um, service berries that they dried down and they would make kind of an early power bar that they carried in a mm -hmm. little pouch. So when they were out hunting, they could just reach in there and, and get a little hit of, uh, of the deer meat and the, uh, the uh, Saskatoon. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I heard it being dried kind of like a fruit leather as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have something really sweet and, you know, you get that burst of flavor and probably more intense when you've dried it down like that. Yeah. Yep. That'd be very much true. And when you're talking about the soups I've had in Germany, cherry soup and blueberry soup, mm -hmm. usually as a starter course, yep. um, it's unusual here in America. You don't usually see fruit <laughs> soups too much, but I haven't tried a service berry soup. I'll have to try a recipe sometime, but I do make a sauce with it, like a mm -hmm. sauce that you can put on over ice cream or like a pound cake, or you could use it on a savory dish, say with pork. Um, how do you use your service berries? Or well, a lot of ours that we, we, that, uh, we're selling usually the fresh fruit, but my wife makes uh, different jams out of those. And she must have about 150 types of jams she puts out. But Saskatoon is one of uh, very popular ones for us. Um, most people in the East Coast aren't familiar with that name, but we have a lot of people in this area that are from the West coast and they immediately recognize it. And they said, they can't find that jam around here. You might find it up in Canada or in the West coast, uh, but they usually don't see it in the grocery stores around here. So that's been very, very popular. And um, it does have a very nice flavor to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It makes a great jam. And I was going to say another use is if you just grab it by the handful, throw mm -hmm. it on your yogurt, you know, you eat it with granola on a cereal. Usually I'll have it like with Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes, you know, a mild tasting cereal that you can really um, get some benefit of the service berry. And then um, that brings us to storage and how long they last fresh. Um, usually I'll keep a couple cupfuls, like yogurt size cupfuls in the fridge, but I'll freeze the rest. How about you? Yeah, well, usually we don't have enough left over because we either sold it or made it into jams. But um, if you're going to freeze it, I'd put it on a pan and treat it pretty much like you do blueberries, where you spread it out 
and people call that flash freezing. Um, it's just so they're separate from each other. So after you've got them frozen in there, then you can put them in the bag and they don't tend to clump up in a big mass. So if you're going to hold them, that would work. Um, you could dry them. We have done that on a small scale. Uh, we do a lot of dried fruit for things like our Asian pears and our apples and our cherries. As, um, you know, we have enough quantity, we can do that. Um, we, they, they do dry down very nicely. It's just that, again, we are moving them fresh market usually and for the jams and that sort of thing. So, uh, but that can be done. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I am adding to my to-do list for the beginning of June, getting out my dehydrator and <laughs> doing a layer of the service berries and testing it out. I'm going to guess it's going to be a couple eight hour sessions at least because it is pretty um, liquid inside. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. not a drier berry, say like a cranberry. Uh, yeah, you ought to play with the temperatures too. Probably, usually we shoot for between 120 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, usually we'll start with eight hours and see how that works. And then you test it and see if it's dried down enough for you. And then see if you want to extend that time or raise the temperature slightly. Hmm. Yeah. And you don't add anything to it. Like I know some no. people will sprinkle mm -hmm. some seasoning on their tomatoes when they dehydrate mm -hmm. them or something like that. But with service berry or Saskatoon's, you probably just dry them straight. No. Yeah. Yeah. We just have done them straight. We don't add anything to them. None of the, the any of the fruit that we dry, we don't add anything to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, mm -hmm. that'll even extend the storage even longer. I'm sure mm -hmm. you could probably have them for years in a jar. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Yeah. So let's dial back to growing your service berry or Saskatoon mm -hmm. um, and your sourcing of them and some of the issues that can come up. So um, I've got mine as little saplings from Arbor Day giveaways mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago. But can you purchase them or how would you propagate them? Well, um, service berry is actually a little difficult to um, root from a cutting. Um, there are some people that will do grafting on them. Um, many of them are grown from seed, of course, and they, they will come from seed. It just would be whatever it pollinated, crossed with, it would be a, um, each one's going to be different. It wouldn't be a cultivar like the, the North Line or the Theisman or the Smoky. Um, as far as growing it, they're pretty, um, I want to say tolerant of different pHs in the soil. If you think of the, the one that's native to the East Coast here, it grows in the edge of woodlands. And uh, here in Central Maryland, our pHs tend to be around five, five, something like that, maybe uh, slightly higher, not much, but tend to be on the acidic side. And they seem to tolerate that very nicely. Um, you don't need to really raise the pH. Like if you're growing a peach tree, I would put that pH up a little higher and it's going to need more calcium in the soil. I just don't think it really needs that. Um, it, there's a, a ton of Maryland native nurseries now that have started. My job's working with the, the nursery and greenhouse industry in the state of Maryland, so I'm familiar with all the different operations out there. But we've just seen a, a, a giant increase in people growing native plants. And um, so you can find plenty of suppliers of things like service berry. Um, even our, our standard nurseries that weren't the native ones have been um, saying that it's a very popular tree to sell as a landscape plant um, if someone's got partial shade in their in their yard i would not stick it out in full sun unless you're going to put a, a ton of organic material in the soil uh, again you see them on the woods on the edge of the woods where you've got leaves that fall down to the ground and twigs and everything that add organic material to the soil it does benefit out of that hmm. if you're going to grow it in full sun and, and we do grow ours in the orchard that way uh, we brought in um, compost leaves and we auger out big holes that are two feet across and we usually go down about 24 inches and fill that full of compost and put those in there. And then um, they seem to thrive. We really haven't done a whole lot of fertilization on ours, again, because we're trying to keep the, the size down on them. And if you think about it in a wood setup, they're not really, I mean, they grow without having additional fertilizer put on there. Um, I mean, it gets a certain amount of nitrogen from the atmosphere because what we're breathing is about 80% uh, nitrogen and 20% uh, oxygen. And when lightning occurs, it fixes that nitrogen. It comes out as rain down to the ground. So there's usually enough nitrogen and it comes out of the rainfall that, that will handle that plant. If your soil is in pretty good shape, mm -hmm. got the organic material, 
and your pH is around the five to five, five, somewhere in there, you'd be fine. Hmm. So similar planting situation to some of our red buds. Mm -hmm. And do you do any irrigation or supplemental watering? Um, when we first transplant that first year, um, we will irrigate. We, we just uh, just came out of a kind of a mini drought here that was going on in central Maryland for the last um, three and a half weeks. The ground was powder dry until that last rain came in. So if you had just transplant it, especially if you had a uh, bare root plant that you'd put in or a young plant that was in a, a pot, it, you'd need to irrigate it during those times. Um, the last three years, it was extremely wet in the spring. So you probably didn't need as much irrigation if you, if you were putting those in. But if it is dry periods, yeah, absolutely. That first year, uh, very important to keep the water to it. Um, the second year, if it's well established in there, it usually rides through. But I mean, if you do have a dry period, then you might irrigate that. Um, once they're established, the root system is pretty extensive on a amyl anchor. And um, they don't seem to require a whole lot of supplemental watering if your soil is in fairly good shape. Mm -hmm. So probably just top dress with leaf grow or your own composted chopped up leaves every once in a while. Yeah, the compost would be a good idea. Again, because in the where they're natively found is in the edge of woods. And so leaves are dropping and breaking down around those and twigs and everything. But most people in their landscape, they want to get rid of all that stuff. They, they use blowers and blow the leaves out and they haul the twigs out. Well, that's the organic material that would go back in the soil. So, yeah, if you're going to do that, then come back in with your compost or your mulch, putting it around there. That would help. Uh, yeah, sure. That would help the soil. Mm -hmm. But probably not touching the bark but close up enough around the root zone. And just around the root zone and don't go more than about two inches uh, layer over that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to suffocate the roots because they, yeah. they need oxygen as well. Yeah. Um, so how about for pruning and care? You, you talked about you're keeping yours down yeah. to a six foot height because you want to access all of it. But if you have it as a landscape plant, maybe you want it to be a little bit taller for looks. Yeah. If, if you're, if you're going for the landscape look, it's going to uh, grow up to about 20, 25 foot. And if, if that works for you and your landscape, that'd be great. The, the thing is, um, as it gets that big, a lot of the fruiting is going to be up very high. And for if you're planning to harvest it, <laughs> unless you like going up ladders um, or you got stilts or something to get up there, um, you're going to find it difficult to really harvest most of that fruit. I mean, there will be some on the lower branches, but as it matures, it's mainly going to be in that upper canopy. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the fruit buds on those things form usually in, um, June, about the end of June for next year. And you want to have the light in on that wood. So, um, we will do our winter pruning mainly just to shape it and bring it down in size. And, and the vigor on those things is, is very strong when we, when we, um, prune them like that, we will get anywhere from uh, three to five feet of growth out of there each year. And what I'll do is um, they've just finished flowering on the Saskatoon ones. The other ones uh, finished earlier, uh, the native, uh, the canadensis. Um, but we'll come back in and depending on how much rain we get here in May, I'll usually come in in late May, early June, and we begin to summer prune. We'll um, take some of that top growth out to get it to branch more because I'm trying to get it to branch low and I want the light in on that those lower branches because that helps form the flower buds for the next year so you're always forward thinking on that the other thing it will do is when we cut the top is it allows the light in on those berries so our um, you get higher sugar content out of your your fruit than you would if it was shaded stay with us after this short ad break Stanton will tell us how to prune properly to increase sugars in the fruit, and how to deal with rust and insect issues on serviceberry and Saskatoons. Want to make your own podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. 
Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I feel like I have more options and with Q&A and polls, it lets me be more creative with the Garden DC podcast. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. So we were talking about pruning and I had just asked you whether winter pruning was necessary on serviceberry or Saskatoons. Okay, so if you're doing winter pruning, that's usually in February or March, and it would be mainly for um, either bringing down the height, if you were not happy with the height it was at that point, and taking out cross branches and that sort of thing. Um, There isn't a whole lot of pruning that you do on it unless you had a a huge amount of vigor out of the plant. Uh, Now, the plant is going to, after it finishes flowering, start putting vegetative growth out. And if your vigor is up in there and your soil is fairly rich, like we have a fair amount of organic material in there, it's going to put shoots up uh, that'll be above those berries. And the uh, flower buds that are going to form for next year usually happen in late June, early part of July for next year. So you always forward think on that. So we'll come in before that uh, flower formation period and we will basically shear the tops and bring it down in height. Um, and what that does is a couple of things. It allows the light in on that lower wood. So the, the flower buds for next year form on that wood that's down low rather than going up higher each time. And the other thing is it allows us the light in on those berries. When you get uh, more sunlight on any of the rosaceous crops like a Saskatoon, which it is, um, then the sugar content goes higher. So you get a berry that's a little bit sweeter than uh, if it had the shading around it. Hmm. So more sun, more sugar. Yeah. (laughs) Good to know. But Mm -hmm. for those of us who have a shadier garden, this Mm -hmm. is one fruit we can grow. Yes. It it would be tolerate, not heavy shade, but Mm -hmm. partial shade. Um, The more sunlight you have, the more flowers you're going to get, more more production. But um, it will produce uh, berries back in shade, just not as heavy production. Um, as you get very dense shade, it's not going to do as well. It, again, you look at the edges of woods is where you'll see the um, amelanchers growing generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes I think that is, and I don't know if this is Mother Nature uh, with her overall plan, that it's at the edge of the woods because that's where the birds sit and in the trees and they've consumed the fruit and then drop the seeds at that point. Part of that, yeah, that might be, yeah, I'm sure there's all sort of a co-evolution thing that goes on between uh, different animals and the fruit and everything. So, yeah, it could be. Hmm. And one final pruning question. Mm -hmm. Do do your sucker and should you take out any sucker growth? It will sucker um, produce, not as much as, uh, say, like a pawpaw would. (laughs) Pawpaws will make a thicket on you pretty quick. Um, But if you do get sucker shoots down the base, um, you would take those out because um, unless you're trying to make a bushy type thing, um, then you would take them out. Um, and we're, let's take one minute and go back to um, if you're going to use the actual Saskatoon, which is mm-hmm. the animal anchor uh, on the folio, um, you'll need to look online for nurseries that carry that. Usually you won't find that in local garden centers and nurseries. It just isn't something they commonly have. But if you look at some of the nurseries for the Midwest, uh, or even I've ordered from Can- uh, Canadian suppliers, uh, or any of the West Coast, out of that, that places out of Oregon or Washington State, um, you should be able to find those named varieties I mentioned er- earlier, like Northline, Smoky, and Theisman. Those are some of the most popular ones. Um, and, that, and you obtain it a bare root. It's usually shipped to you um, in late February, early March. And then you transplant that out into your uh, landscape or your garden. Hmm. So when you're getting a bare root stick sent to you, you mm-hmm. would probably soak it in a bucket overnight? Well, it depends on how they shipped it. it um, quite often the nurseries now 
wrap them in a, uh, they'll put uh, sphagnum moss around the base or, or something that holds moisture. So now they're using uh, shredded paper and they wrap plastic around it. So they hold them fairly moist. Um, you certainly don't want that to dry out. If you take it out of that plastic bag and they're going to transplant, um, if it's sunny and windy out, then I'd certainly, yeah, put it in a bucket of water um, to keep it from drying out until you get your hole prepared and everything. Usually I would go out and dig a hole first. We use an auger to auger our holes out. Then we'll bring them out and we keep the roots pretty much um, out of the direct sunlight and the wind and put them right in the ground because that drying out would be a factor for you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm thinking about when I received bare root roses, yeah. similar, similar time of year. Yeah. Um, of course, with those, you're making a kind of like volcano mm -hmm. uh, in the hole to spread the roots around. Are you doing the similar thing for the, um, Saskatoon? Well, the, um, again, we auger in the orchard, we're augering a hole that's mm -hmm. two feet around with a big auger. And so, yeah, we'll spread the roots out on that. If you're digging a hole, I'd go as wide as you can and put as or much organic material in around that root zone and spread the roots out. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Yeah. So let's turn to some of the issues people encounter when growing service berries or Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. And the number one complaint I hear is the rust. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the cedar rust. Yeah. Um, the, um, there's two different rusts that are major problems for us. One is the cedar apple rust and then quince rust. Both of those will get on um, their same genus, different species of rust. Um, but both of them will infect a uh, Saskatoon. Um, the one will make... On the quince rust, it'll make the stem uh, swell and it gets kind of an orangish color uh, as the basidia um, uh, spores are being produced in there. Uh, the other one will make the fruit actually um, it, it's be green and it's just when it's about turning red, you're going to see it looks like a, um, a almost a Christmas ornament. These little things are sticking out of it, look like horns coming out of that fruit. And that's the um, uh, spore producing stage of the rust where it can now spread to additional fruit and foliage. And also it blows back to the native um, juniper, what people call juniper, which is a gen or a cedar tree, uh, Juniferus virginiana. And that's where the, the rust overwinters is on those native trees. And so at this time of year, for the last uh, three weeks, the spore countdown has been extremely high uh, for rust. And uh, we put out reports to the horticulture industry where we'll, we'll record the, what's happening with this and tell them, hey, if you're going to do some sort of treatment, it's right now that you put uh, protectant uh, sprays on there. Um, the good part is that mini drought we were through, that we had a lot of spores. It really wasn't conducive for the, the rust fungi to get established really well. The, the previous three years, it was very wet in the spring. And we had spore counts stay up there for about six, seven weeks. And with that wet foliage, that gave a good place for it to germinate and grow and on those fruit. So when you have a wet year, you're going to see more rust. Um, uh, and on a drier year, you'll see less of it. Uh, you'll probably not eliminate it, but um, the only way you could really prevent that is to use fungicides on there on a preventative basis. And your timing would be the important thing. So if you had a, a great big tree, 25 feet high, well, lots of luck there. I mean, I don't know how you'd get coverage of anything you're trying to put on there. Um, a smaller plant, if you keep them down, the advantage is if you are going to put a fungicide on there, you can easily cover that and not cover yourself with all the fungicide when you're, when you're doing your spraying. Yeah, is it worth it is the question. Um, depends on the person. The... Um, Birds don't prefer the ones with the rust on it too, which is kind of interesting. They prefer the ones that don't have the rust. Um, yeah, for each person, it's their own personal decision on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is a little unsightly, and you know when you're picking, you can mm -hmm. feel it immediately when yeah. you're picking the berries, and you feel that hard like nugget part of it. Yeah, and you definitely, I would think, want to discard those. Yeah, it uh, often um, it doesn't get all the berries. Okay, mm -hmm. you might get half of them or a quarter of them. So then you got to pick around there. So it's just more time consuming if you have to do that picking. 
Yeah, and you get Cheeto fingers, as I call them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good description. <laughs> yeah, so you'll you'll reach your hand in, and if some of them are have a touch of the rust, you'll you'll draw back, and you'll get like an orange powder yeah. on the back of your hand or your fingertips, which yeah. is easily washable. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the insect end, there is an insect um, um, called the lace bug. And if you've grown azaleas before or Japanese Andromeda, you've, you've seen lace bug damage on the foliage where it stipples it. Um, the amelanchor is susceptible to um, a native um, lace bug that we have here. It overwinters as an adult and they're down in the leaf litter. They come out when that new foliage is coming out and the female will lay eggs into the leaf. You may see a little bit of stippling on the foliage. They, they pierce the foliage and they break the chlorophyll down, so you get kind of a silvering effect on the foliage. Um, if you've got it in partial shade, it's not a big deal. Uh, if you put them out in full sun, that lace bug can be a bigger deal. Okay, So it might be more of a factor for you. Now, the, the good thing is we have a bunch of spiders <laughs> And not everybody's impressed with spiders in the landscape, but actually it's a, a sign of a healthy landscape. They do a wonderful job of suppressing uh, things like the lace bugs. The, they'll go after the nymphs, take them down, and do a good job of keeping them down the population. Hmm. Yeah. And that does bring up Stanton that every once in a while when I reach in to pick the berries, mm -hmm. I'll get a little spider yeah. um, will jump in my cup or, you know, yeah. touch my hand. And, yeah. you know, they're just little guys. Yeah. It's not like a big brown no. or a recluse or something like that. No, no. And, you know, uh, people say to have some innate uh, fear of spiders and think they're all bad. They're, they're, you know, all you do is brush it off and leave them alone. They're wonderful predators, and um, they really aren't interested in taking you on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and I would say, you know, if one lands in your cup, just escort it out, right. and, it. or just kind of tip it out, and it's happy to leave. Or I put it back up on a higher branch or something like that. Right, right, and that's part of an integrated pest management um, approach on things: is you accept that you're going to have something like that show up in there and it's actually beneficial. So, yeah. Hmm. And going back to the, the picking tips we had give, er, given earlier mm -hmm. and you had talked about bringing the branches inside to, to take off the berries. Mm -hmm. I thought of one more way that that's actual benefit is because so many times when you're picking, you know, you're listening to a podcast or some music and you're outside enjoying the outdoors and picking a lot of them don't make it into the cup. <laughs> so, and that's just because they drop quickly. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you touch a couple and they'll yeah. drop. So you're, you're missing a bunch by doing that. Maybe laying a tarp underneath might help. Yeah. If you're going to pick outside, yeah, that, that certainly would help. And say, you know, cutting off some of the branches, if, because the way we're doing it with the renewal pruning and getting new growth out of there, taking some of those branches out, aren't that big a deal. Um, and it's easy to lay it out on the table because some of them do just drop off on their own. And so you can scoop it up off the table and put them in your bowl when you're ready to go. Yeah, I find that once they hit the ground, they're lost. Yeah. It's, I figure those are for the birds because yeah. it's impossible in the in the leaf litter or the grass to find them again. Absolutely. They're small berry. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And then uh, at my family's cousin's blueberry farm, they joke about weighing you as you leave to pick your own farm uh, because there's the the berries that are in the pails and then there's the berries that are in your tummy. Right. Um, so how much are you eating as you're gleaning? Are you asking me personally? Yes, or I'm this? asking you personally, <laughs> oh, Stanton. Well, well, because we're selling them, we just about everything goes in for the market. Um, yeah, I'm kind of Captain Bly when it comes to uh, any of my family members helping to pick with it. Everything goes to market. <laughs> mm, ah, yeah. so you're you're a bit of a, a taskmaster that way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I will say I'll, as I approach the, the first picking, mm -hmm. I'll probably eat, you know, 10. Yeah. You know, a handful to start and then you get to work picking. Yeah. I think that that's common for a lot of people is you want to taste them first and then start picking and then, you know, graze on them a little bit afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there are more and more plantings in our area, especially of the, the eastern varieties where, you know, 
office parks, government facilities are putting in service berries. And I think people are wondering, is it okay to glean from those? Well, <laughs> if they're on public land, I would certainly check to make sure that they don't have any problem with uh, gleaning going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's, it's someone else's property of certainly, you'd want to ask them before you, you harvest those out of there. Um, but yeah, they are being planted heavily as part of a native plant uh, uh, push. And uh, also people trying to feed, uh, feed the wildlife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would say people who are doing wildlife gardening are planting them for the birds. But then I see clusters of them, you know, at um, shopping centers even now, uh, even at a Walmart. I visited, had a whole kind of bank of them to the side, which was great to see. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Hmm. So any final thoughts on growing Saskatoon or service berries for our listeners? I would say um, it's a good fruit to try in a backyard for a native thing. Um, you do have to deal with the birds. Okay. So you have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. And I certainly would not... Um, keep um, Jennifer's Virginiana in my landscape near those plants because that would increase the chance of the rust. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had didn't have that plant around the area and didn't have the spore count, you're not going to have nearly the amount of uh, damage from that. Um, but other than that, it's a, it's a fun fruit to try. Uh, if you just want to try them out, um, we'll be at the Olney Market uh, after Mother's Day. And the, ours should be in, uh, say, about June, about when our cherries come in. You can stop by and See if you like the fruit uh, before you uh, decide you're going to jump in and start growing those things. Great. And for those outside the area and not familiar, um, the only market is in Upper Montgomery County, Maryland, about, I'm going to say, 15 miles north of Washington, D.C. or so. Mm -hmm. and... Straight on uh, Prince Philip Avenue and mm -hmm. Route 108. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for that, Stanton, and thank you for all your advice about growing Saskatoon and service berries. The best of luck to all the audience. I hope you do well with it. Bearded Iris Plant Profile Bearded Iris, Iris Germanica, is a group of European hybrid iris, also known as the German bearded irises. They are considered to be a natural hybrid between Iris pallida and Iris variegata. There are thousands of bearded iris cultivars available. The cultivars come in every color and combination from pure whites to pinks, browns, yellows, and almost jet black, though the classic bearded iris is a deep purple. They are perennial plants that typically bloom in mid to late spring. Note that some cultivars can rebloom in the fall. Bearded irises are hardy to USDA zones 3 to 9. They are deer resistant and drought tolerant. They prefer to grow in full sun with well draining soils. If they do not get enough sunlight, the flower stalks will stretch and flop over. If they are in too much moisture, the roots will rot. Do not apply a high nitrogen fertilizer as this encourages leaf growth and can make the plant susceptible to bacterial rot. They can be propagated by seed or by division. You will need to divide them every three to five years so they don't become too crowded. The best time to divide the plants is during the late summer or early fall. When you plant the new divisions, be sure the soil level is just to the top of the rhizomes and not burying them. The foliage stays evergreen most of the year. In the fall, you can trim back any brown or floppy leaves or fans. Clearing out this dead foliage can prevent the dreaded iris borer from wintering over in the plants. In addition to the typical tall varieties of bearded iris, there are also miniature and dwarf versions. The smaller kinds typically bloom earlier in the season than the larger ones. Bearded iris, you can grow that. What's new this week in the garden? Well, what's not blooming? I mean, my peonies, my roses, my bearded irises, everything's looking fabulous. The wygela, 
the Colquitsia. Ah, I'm in love with springtime in the DC area. And that includes the beautiful azaleas. And if you check our website, washingtongardener.blogspot.com, and you scroll down to the Tuesday, April 25th, 2023 entry, you'll see our top local spots for azalea viewing, the best bloom displays in the DC, Maryland, Virginia region. Check those out, and I hope you get to visit a few of those and I would love your suggestions as well. Um, So if you have any that I haven't listed there, please do share them with Washington Gardener. And speaking of Washington Gardener magazine, our April 2023 issue is up and posted on that same website, washingtongardener.blogspot.com. The cover story is on the year of Spirea. We also have stories on what's dining in your garden and that would be referring to deer and rabbits and other things that munch on your uh, plants. Uh, Basil King of Herbs is profiled. We talk about a new variegated azalea, lawn mowing safety tips, organic weed control options, a profile of the president and CEO of the American Horticultural Society, Susan Laporte, and much, much more in that April issue. And again, you can check that out online at washingtongardener.blogspot.com and you can subscribe uh, from that same website to get a PDF of the issue sent to you into your inbox. And a few local upcoming events for you to check out. Uh, The first is the Maryland Native Plant Society's monthly program this month of coming up May 23rd at 7 p.m. They are meeting on Zoom and the discussion is life cycles, landscape practices, and growing native plants from seed by Heather McCargo. And you can sign up for that for free at mdflora.org. And then I will be giving a talk on gardening for dry shade for Brookside Gardens. And that is on Wednesday, May 24th at 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. And that is online. You can sign up for that through the Active Montgomery website. And even if you can't attend the class live online, you can watch the recording later. That same evening, uh, if you want to attend a live in-person and lively event, you can go to Tudor Place's Spring Garden Party from 6 to 9 p.m. And you can find out more about that and how to buy tickets to that at TudorPlace.org. Happy gardening! Get low-maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of the perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. 
With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at Amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is the last word on using Arborist Wood Chips by Carol Allen. I am an ISA certified arborist, native plant enthusiast, foe of invasive plant species, landscape designer, and horticulturist. So first of all, what are Arborist Wood Chips? They are the byproduct of the tree removal process. Tree removal companies use very large chippers to render twigs and branches into smaller pieces. Also. Your local municipal waste depot may use what is called a tub grinder to do kind of the same thing to yard waste brought to the recycling centers around town. But my preference is the product that is produced by our local tree removal companies. It generally will not have invasive species or weed seeds mixed in. I started using arborist wood chips for mulch about 50 years ago. I had just moved on to a property where the side yard, my kitchen view, had a nice stand of oaks and hickories, but where the previous owners had been mowing for years. Because of the shade, there was no grass, and because it was steeply sloped, they had mowed it down to rocky bare earth. The organic matter, so necessary for good soil and good plant growth, was non-existent. I did not have the funds to renovate this area by more conventional means, so I had to use what was readily available and inexpensive. I found I could get a 10 cubic yard truck full at one time, and I moved about three truckloads into that area. I laid down a carpet of about four to six inches deep. The immediate effect was to mitigate the stormwater runoff and erosion. At that depth, arborist wood chips are great at suppressing weeds. Then that first autumn I let the leaves fall and accumulate. By the second spring and every year thereafter I started planting this area. Within the first year I had a nice thick layer of organic material to work with and that rocky dry soil was rich and friable and now 50 years later I have colonies of trilliums and other spring ephemerals. Some I planted and some, mm, they just came in. Thank you, nature. So the addition of a thick organic layer kickstarts the decomposition process, bringing beneficial bacteria and fungi to break down large pieces of organic matter, like leaves and the outer surface of wood chips, and makes them into smaller bits. This activity and the increased organic matter attracts other soil-dwelling organisms that carry out their life cycles and pretty soon you have a whole village of different soil-dwelling organisms living there and moving that organic matter deeper into the soil profile. So why do you care? Well, plants co-evolved with these beneficial organisms, particularly the fungi and bacteria, and they facilitate water and nutrient uptake in plants. There is no need to fertilize when you can establish a healthy soil microecology. But fast forward to now. I still use arborist wood chips as mulch when I am initiating a new bed. I let the tree leaves take over after that first year, and that works well in my wooded property. But I also use the technique in my clients' wooded areas. I like that it is produced locally, is a byproduct of an existing industry, and has a relatively low carbon footprint. However, now that I'm a scientist, I take a more objective approach and I follow the research initiated by Linda Chalker Scott of Washington State University. They have produced a wonderful fact sheet called Wood Chip Mulch, Landscape Boon or Bane. It lays out all of the pros and cons of using arborist wood chips. Well, I could go on for hours, but this is the last word on using Arborist Wood Chip Mulch by Carol Allen, Horticulturist.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to WashingtonGardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.